I was born and bred at Asin Bumpe, Fusu Roman Catholic Hospital. Wow. Asin Fusu. Okay. And my real village, the original, is Asin Dumpe. Asin Dumpe. Yeah, right. just a kilometer. Now it's part of Fusu. Because of urbanization and development, now it's part of Fusu. But it's developed, it's no longer a village. Oh, it's still a village compared to it. Is that, any, is that part of the reasons why you still call yourself a village? Why? Yeah. Uh, I'm just proud of where I'm coming from. Okay. I don't want to be. You know, some people, when they make it in life, they don't even want people to know nah. their past. I was born and bred in a village. When I share this story mm -hmm. with you, it will motivate some youth to take their destiny into their own yeah. hands. So I'm not afraid to share my past with you. I was born and bred at Asendong. At 1968, I was taken to Kumasi because my father was a teacher there. Okay. I went to school in Kumasi, Bantima Presby. I know Bantima Presby. Yeah. Then from there, I went to Sojalai. That's why I actually went to school too. Hey, oh no, I'm just young court, young court, young court, young court. I went to Sojalai. From there to practice school. Okay. Then they brought me back to my village because. I was a troublesome boy, always wow. fighting. <laughs> so my father couldn't take it. He brought me back to my village. So I completed elementary school in my village, at Saint Okay. I went to Ansar College at the age of 16 because I completed SA7, what they call SA7, from four, which was quite young, right? Old. Old? Because my classmates got a, some them were around 10, 11. Okay. Some of my classmates, I'm turning 60 next month. They are about 55 to 56. Okay. So, let me you, you were like your big brother. Right. Okay. Okay. But now, what kind of home did you grow up in? I, I see a lot of discipline in you whenever you speak. Um, you know. Yeah. But what was the upbringing like at home? If you didn't you know, to sing. my, I'll tell you the truth. Mm. That they are three. I lived with my grandmother. Okay. Any time I was being bad in what she did was that, you know, in the village, we were classmates, myself, Opon, Steven Yamiche, and Gukuma. We called something a Nobua, meaning Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. these young men or young boys will go and weed some bush to make a create a farm. Mm -hmm. So today is Ken on Saturday. The next Sunday is Bukuma. Then the two left, Stephen Yamiche and Opon, will be the following week. Okay. So by the time the farming season starts, we have our own farms. We have our own farms. At that tender age? Yes. And my grandmother will be doing everything because I go to school. She cannot cut these big trees. Exactly. I fell the big trees. So we will do that. Then she takes over. Again, when I was in Kumasi, I was staying with my father. My father didn't know how to train kids. He was a teacher, surprisingly. But every mistake with a slap, that is why I'm not afraid of anything. Wow. Every mistake. My father That's never slap. sat with me even to tell me why you shouldn't do this. One mistake, wow, wow, wow. So it got to a point I was not even scared of anybody again. Your body created resistance for that. Then, when I went to Adsadi College, I moved to Accra because my mother has remarried. My stepfather, now he's at East Lego. My mother is passed. There, we were staying at Kokomimli. Um, Multimedia. Challenge, challenge bookshop. Okay. The technicals to Accra, ATTC. Okay. Yeah, that's where we're staying. But exactly opposite uh, Isaac Osei's house. There. there. I wasn't a bad boy, but I like fighting. So anytime you hear people coming to my home, it means I'm beating somebody. <laughs> but the difference between my stepfather and my father is that my stepfather 
who put me in his car. He's a soldier, a border, border guard. That is where they have the immigration headquarters. When he comes back from work, then he take his car to do some taxi. I'll be sitting in front, and this man will be advising me. Oh, don't do this, don't do that. I never had that from my real father. He wouldn't have time. A teacher only slaps. Booty. A lot of things. Was it like that only at home, or it was, it was, his, it was his character? Wow. I think he's a hardcore guy, too. Okay. Very hardcore guy. I've seen him fight several times. Wow. Yeah, with my grandfather. My grandfather was a chief. That one is a long story. <laughs> my grandfather didn't want him to marry my mother. Okay. So that generated that has some has issues. Yes. Okay. All right. But he was a hardcore guy. In fact, the teachers called him boxer. Okay. Yeah. He's a lefty. One mistake, boom, ah. even among his own teachers, he was, you know, those things. But I think that is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. My son is here. I don't remember. I think I blushed him once. <laughs> I've he never said once. once. Yeah, once. I've <laughs> never, you know. But I'm sure that one even came with, you know, some talks around. Oh, yes. I, mean, I, liked, I liked talking to my... You know, it got to a point, I didn't respect my father because... He didn't give me anything. Mm -hmm. It was only beating, you know. But I respect my stepfather to date. My mother is dead. The house is still there. Every month I take care of them. Because of the way he taught me real life. And I can tell you, you know, when my father thought I was a bad boy and I didn't listen, my stepfather thought I was a very good boy. He had 14 kids. Okay. And his cousin asked him, he wants to do him a favor. One of his children, he wants to take to Germany. And my stepfather chose me. Out of the 14 kids? Out of his 14 kids, rare ones. The man chose me. So you were not bad after all. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, the training that my father gave me, that's why you know, I think uh, he wasn't a good father. Wow. He didn't teach me. You, you, had a, you had a very interesting childhood. Honorable, I. From what you said, I now know where your interest in farming came from. But now, let's bring it back to now. Um, farming isn't really a thing the youth are getting into. It's it, it's it's not enticing. I don't know what you mean. Like I don't know your time. Um, I was going to give you one. Hour, but I'll give you more if you have time. No, we can do three hours. So <laughs> let me continue. And the people listening have to get the upbringing mm -hmm. how I started life. So I decided college. When I came to stay in Accra, my father, my mother used to sell latokashi on a small table between uh, Mr. Donko from Agogo and Mr. Jivon. Mm -hmm. In between them, two ladies, they'll be facing each other, Auntie Foster and my mother. They'll put their tables together and sell. Then in the evening, they'll pack everything in a box yeah. and go and put it in those shops. So what I did that time was that my mother was selling what we call wick. Wick is a, what we put in the lantern so that you lay the match. Yeah. Blade. And the blade, they had two types. Tatra. Blue. Blue. <laughs> the nazi with the crocodile on it. We have some PK, chocolate. So we create a board, then we put a bit on each. Then we go around. Yes, pick a chocolate, touch a nose, that yes, raw. We sell it, hawking on the street. And it was a competition among the brothers mm -hmm. or siblings. And one guy always made more money than me, upon now he's uh, a pastor. As of all. You know? Then I graduated into selling lead bars. Lead bars is what they use for guns, the local guns. Okay, buckets, aluminum buckets. So in 1981, when I was going to sis phone, there was a lady from his Equiapim half in Nigeria, okay. married to a Nigerian. And they were bringing a lot of 
stuff. That time, Ghana, because of uh, Rawlings and his coup and whatever happened, he handed over to the man. There were a lot of shootings. So I remember very well NNSC, Nigeria National Supply Commission, Mark. Um, there are some, they call it wire. When you want to trap an animal, okay. the fans, you know, that's what they use. So, yeah. So this woman will bring all these things, I'll sell, make money. Then it, so when I was going to this form, I was rich. Myself, not my parents, my parents, but through business. Through business. So when I finished this form, my stepfather's cousin mm -hmm. asked, which of your children do you want me to help? And he said, take my son, Ken. That time, what his real children said was that, I don't know how to put it, uh, I said, what to unsu and out the baha ashim, meaning you take your intestines out and put leaves okay. in your stomach. Means they were not in support of what was happening. Yeah, meaning I was not mm -hmm. the real child. And he took the stepchild instead of the real child. But all the real children that I took them to America, none of them has even come back to say that brother or sister, let me also help you. They, could, they didn't do it. What it means is that if any of them had first gone, gone that would have been the end of the family. True. true. That's very true. So, if you want a real prophet, my stepfather is a prophet. He's the one. Yeah, he's the one. He, he, he foresaw. The sides, yes. Yeah, he foresaw yeah, yeah. that the future of my family does not come from my own children, but my stepson. I'm sure that he is, he's very proud of you now. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, if I'm not mistaken, your first opportunity out of Ghana was Germany. Yeah, Germany. How long did you stay there? Uh, I stayed there for 18 months. 18 months. Then I went to America. How did, how did you just move to America through that? 18 months. Yeah, I worked hard. And the lady that I was staying with, an elderly woman, uh, she took me through a lot. You know, it was not easy to get a job. So I got a job at a restaurant. It's called Times Square on Holmes Boutel or whatever. And I'll start working at around 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. After that, 5 to 5. Then from 5 p.m., uh, 5 a.m., I'll drive to Promat and also do two hours. <laughs> so I'll finish about nine. Then I'll come home, I'll get home around 11. Sometimes in the train, I'll fall asleep mm -hmm. and even miss my station. I have to come back. When you sleep at 11, 2 p.m., the woman will call you. Kennedy. That's just three hours. Yes, Kennedy, when you go to America, you're going to go to school and work at the same time. You have to start from here. I have to clean the lady's house before I go to work at five. Now, brother, and when you get there in Germany, you work. So I have to work at the restaurant for 12 hours again and go back to Promat. In two hours. In yeah, two hours. You couldn't sleep. I made money. And that's how I was able to you go to the US. Yeah, America. And in fact, I'll be honest with you, the Germans, they are hardworking more than the Americans. They will really use you. So when I went to America, the second day, I got a job at Zaru Bakery. Okay. Which was not possible in Germany. In Germany. So it was a dream come true. I work at Zaru Bakery in a freezer. So when they make the doughs, they put it in the racks and put it in the freezer. Very cold. When it comes out, it's like a stone. Then they'll pour it again before they put it in the oven. So I was there, and one day in my own building, 
I was coming out and I met my senior, Baba Moro, he's in Kumasi. Okay. Coming out. Then he asked me, hey, what are you doing? And I'm so I live here. I said, what? I also live here. He was on the sixth floor, 5J, and I was 6H, 178th Street. So he said he works at a gas station. So he fixed me, gas station as well. So I do the bakery 40 hours, and I'll come and do gas station. And listen, why there is no secret room anywhere? <laughs> my 40 hours, my permanent job is the bakery. But those Ghanaians who have stayed in America for long, after work, all they know, most of them, entertainment. Mm -hmm. So weekends, they'll give their shift to me go and go to parties, and I will stay in and work. That's what I want my son to learn. Monday evening, I start from 10 p.m. to 6 then by the time I finish checking the, the sales, it will be around 8. I have to start work at 12. So I'll go home, get some farina and some soup, then straight to Zaro Bakery around Hans Point. That's where your official 40 hours begins. Yes. So I came to a point, I was doing 88 hours a week from the gas station. I start Monday, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. That gives you 16 hours. Wednesday, 10 to 6. That gives you 24. Then you do Thursday. Okay, that gives you 32. Then you do Friday. Now listen. Friday, 10 to Six gives you the 40 hours. Saturday, 24 hours. And Sunday, 24 hours. So I get 88 hours straight. And you know, because if you make the slightest mistake you make, you die. They will shoot you. Yeah. America, you are dealing with money, this kind. So they have bulletproof. You only slide the money here. A gun cannot even go. Exactly. Right. So, Saturday, Sunday, I have curtains on the floor. This uh, the oil. I remove them. The ones that I'm selling, the coal, whatever. So, I will tear them apart and make it like a bed and sleep on it. Whilst you are sleeping, you are dozing them. Somebody knocks. Knocks. Pump number five. Twenty dollars. Your eyes are red. Wow. You're using the computer. Oh, no, sorry, but how old were you at this point? No, I was uh, in 1985. I was 25 years. And so you didn't force it through the season when no. at times. No. Your body just took this long. Yeah. Because of the training from Germany, mm -hmm. it was easy for me. Easy for you. Germany, I was washing plates, and my brother, if I put my hand in the hot water. Or after bath, you see these white things here. Mm -hmm. I have used shea butter, so you can see. All these years in Germany, yeah, was washing plates. Just for 18 months, but till date, you if you are with me here, yeah, after bath, you see these white things here. So America was heaven with all these jobs. The thing is, you just went in for the jobs, so it wasn't a challenge for you because what you're saying would be a challenge for somebody else. The challenge would be that you wouldn't want to spend that number of hours. And let me tell you, those we met with their green card and American passport, most of them were working in the hotels. They were making $240, $250 a week. And the 88 hours, I was making only 285. Then the Zaro Bakery, mm -hmm. the 40 hours, my take home was $120. But you see, because I put in more hours, I was making 
about three quarters more than those with their green card and the passport because I was earning $400 a week. Those with their passports, American citizen and whatever, were making $250. You're making way more than that. Yeah, because I put in more hours. Then I have a friend here, also from Pong. He stays at Pachimota. And Baba Moro taught me how to drive. I didn't know how to drive until, you know, I ate 24, not like them. <laughs> you know, so Baba Moro taught me how to drive. I decided to drive taxi. So I've saved money. I went to auction and bought Chevy Impala. Same scenario. If you make a mistake, you're going to die. So we have bulletproof in the car. So with the insurance and everything, it came to $3,000. I didn't have my green card, but I started working, driving taxi in the Bronx. And listen, who says it's and you can make it? You can make it. In seven months, I had eight taxis. From the first one you had bought? Yeah. For every month, every day, I saved $100. The seven days will give me seven hundred. But I make more money in the weekends. So I use that to pay my rent and food. But the weekend you will still make more money that if I save hundred weekends I can make about one hundred eighty on Saturday, Friday night, another one eighty on Friday night, uh, Saturday, Saturday night. night yeah. And the someday, you know, know around a year, come back home, right? maybe one twenty, one thirty. So, in a month, I save three thousand dollars. Then I'll go to auction. I want him to listen. My son is standing there. He has to listen. Can he listen? He has a lot of things on silver platter. So, I'll go there, auction, buy this car. Do the insurance with lawyer man quite big brokerage, do the partition and everything, and I'll give it to somebody to drive. You pay forty dollars a day. I don't want stories until this is where probably my father's style or whatever comes, comes in. Through. If I give it to you, it's contract. Sunday evening, you bring my two eighty. The only time you give me excuse. It's when I take the car to workshop for maintenance. So regardless, you should still make the money. Yeah, you make my money. 280. And was this cool for them? Did they see you? Oh as yeah, $40. Oh, that, look, look, because on my own, I save 100 Yeah. So if you, I bought a car for you, out of the 100 you have 60 and have 40 If you are working, you can't make the 60 hour time. Because I do zero bakery a week hundred than 20 and you are making sixty dollars. Yeah. yeah, and you are making sixty dollars a day. So it was very good money. So I didn't want any story. So with these eight taxis, I saved twenty-four thousand dollars. My stepfather was a border guard. He went on pension, Jubilee House, mm -hmm. or was uh, WO's quarters that he was staying. They had to throw their things out. Because my stepfather didn't prepare. So they didn't have anywhere to stay. Then Azuma Nelson and his boss, Mr. Asa, they used to have Paramount Hotel on my Chimota. Yeah. Azuma came to fight. There was a shop, a liquor store, on 114 and Lenos Avenue. It's called Fred Wines and Liquor. It was a Ghanaian who said that, opened that shop. So most of the taxi drivers, when we are in Harlem and we are tired, we just go and park our car there. I went in there and I saw Azuma Nelson. Wow. That, that was your first time meeting him? Yeah. Okay. And the boss, Mr. Asa. So talking, I said, oh, say, I have money for my mother. They've thrown them out of their house. But I don't know how to get the money. 
The man looked at me and my age, and I mentioned 24,000. He was surprised. So I gave him $16,000.